Welcome back. What I want to do in this video is I want to talk about a very interesting and a, also a very important part of the immune system. And this is the complement system. So this is the complement system. And specifically, before we actually get into the details of the complement system, what I, want to, what I want to do is I want to mention that the complement system is a system of proteins. And these proteins, as we're going to find, are serine proteases. And they, they, they add to or they augment the function of the antibodies. And specifically, there are three pathways of complement system activation. There's the antibody-mediated or the classical pathway. There's also the alternative pathway, and there's a lectin pathway. What we're going to, and, and, and one thing that's important to realize is that they all converge at a common pathway. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to, we're, we're not going to look at the final common pathway, but we're at least going to look at the very beginning, the very beginning of the, um, the, the antibody mediated system. And of course, that's the, the classical pathway. Okay, so the first thing we have to look at is we have to look at the antibody, right? So what I'm drawing here is I'm drawing the antibody, right? So the the inner chains, those are the heavy chains, right? And the, the lighter chains, of course, the smaller ones are the light chains, right? And so this part down here, sort of where I'm dividing it, down here is the FC portion of the antibody, right? And up here are the variable regions, right? And the variable regions, remember, that's where the antigen binds into the antibody, right? And so what happens? Well, Let's say that in some area of the body, we have an antibody, right? We have an antibody, and it complexes with an antigen. So it complexes with an antigen, right? So here's my antigen in blue. Well, what we have to realize is whenever an antibody complexes with an antigen, what ends up happening is there becomes, there becomes an exposed binding site on the FC portion of the antibody. And specifically with respect to, with respect to IgM and IgG, it's, the, it's the, the constant H2 region. Actually, that H should be as a subscript, should be as a subscript. It is specifically the constant heavy chain 2 region. So it's part of the heavy chain. It's part of the heavy chain. We see that here. It's part of the constant region, obviously, and it's the second subunit of the heavy chain, okay, or the second area of the heavy chain, right? So it's the CH2. And one thing I do want to mention is that specifically the, the antibodies that, that act to activate the complement system are IgG and IgM, okay? So recall that IgM is the initial antibody that's synthesized against an antigen um, in terms of the primary immune response. But after that, there's class switching and the IgMs form into, uh, or at least the, the plasma cells that make the antibodies, they do class switching. And then from then on, the antibodies that are released, at least in large amounts, are IgG, and those are from the memory effector plasma cells. Okay, but anyways, enough on that. So what's going to happen is the antibody is going to bind the antigen. And as soon as it does, there's a conformational change in the antibody. And what I tried to draw there, at least where there were, there's regions on the FC portion of the antibody that, that are binding sites for another protein. And this particular protein, this protein is called... It is called C1Q. It's called C1Q. So C1Q. And on the C1Q, there are other components. There are other components. There are two. I'm just, actually, let me do this. Let me do this. Let me do this in white. So there are, there are specifically two C1Rs. And there are two C1Ss. So you could essentially think of the, the C1 complement protein as a pentamer. It, the, the, the main portion of it is the C1Q, and specifically that's the one that binds ultimately to the FC portion of the antibody. And then it has two C1Rs that are initially inactive and two C1Ss that are initially inactive. Okay, so what happens first? Well, initially what's going to happen is when C1Q binds to the FC portion, one of the C1Rs, um, or at least the C1Q changes conformation, and this activates one of the C1Rs, right? This activates one of the C1Rs. So 
one of the C1Rs becomes activated, and it, of course these are serine proteases, right? So through a serine protease mechanism, this C1R is going to activate its partner C1R, right? It's going to activate its partner C1R. And once both C1Rs are activated, then they go and they activate the C1Ss. Okay, so the initial thing that happens is C1Q binds, and this causes a conformational change and activates one of the C1Rs, which then activates its partner C1R, and then they both activate the C1Ss. And it turns out the C1S, the C1S, the C1S is the active serine protease. It is the acting, active serine protease in terms of activating C2 and C4. And C2 and C4 are two other proteins that come into this complex once, um, once C1S becomes activated. Okay. Now, the, you know, unfortunately for at least people learning the complement system, the numbers, at least of the, in terms of the activation, don't occur in order. The numbers correspond to the order in which the proteins were discovered. So, unfortunately, they're not in order. And in fact, the next, the next, um, the next um, protein that comes in and is activated is C4. So again, it's not in order. So what happens? What happens? So let's let's take a let's get a zoomed in. Um, effect down here. So I have my antigen, right? I have my antigen down here, and specifically on it we have the antibody, right? So here's my antibody, right? And like like we mentioned on it, there was the C1. So here's C1, right? Here's C1. And specifically what I'm concerned about right now is I'm concerned about C1S. So here's C1S, okay? And, and C1S is the active serine protease. So I'll go ahead and put the serine residue right there. So the active serine protease is the C1S. The purpose of the C1R was to activate the C1S. Okay. Now one thing that's important to understand about C4, and actually this is this is also true, this is also true of C3, is that C4 um, has an internal thioester bond. What does that mean? Well, C4 is going to look something like this, and I'll do it in purple. Let me let me draw it like this. So here's C4, C4, and on the region that will actually become the C4B component, there's an internal thioester bond. So there was a carboxyl group right here, but if effectively it got turned into a thioester. So it looks something like this. So on one side it was a carboxylate residue, and on the other side it was a cysteine. So now you have an internal thioester. And it turns out that um, this thioester is unstable, and it actually plays a role in binding to the antigen. And of course, the antigen is the bacterial cell right here. Right? This is the the antigen of the bacterial cell that we're trying to destroy ultimately. Right? And the C4 is going to come in. Right? The C4 is going to come in. So let me let me draw it like this. So here's the C4. Right? There's the C4. And so what ends up happening is the C4 binds, and the way it binds is like this. So if you picture, let me, let me do this in, you know, let me do it like this. If you picture a an amine residue, right? The amine is a nucleophile, right? So what can happen is, I'll do this mechanism in blue, the amine can do a nucleophilic attack, and effectively it's a nucleophilic acyl substitution, right? And it kicks off the cysteine residue, right? So what ends up happening is initially, um, assuming the C4 binds, right, you end up having an amide linkage. You end up having an amide linkage, and the reason you have an amide linkage is because attached on the antigen, you have the amine residues. So maybe there's an amine residue right there, right, and then here there would also be an amine residue. And so that effectively attaches C4, so this right here is C4, it effectively attaches C4 to the membrane. Now, one thing that's important to understand about C4 is um, the serine protease, C1S, is going to effectively hydrolyze C4 into two components, right? So one component, and I'll do this in, let me do this in purple again, one component is the C4A, okay, is the C4A. So C4A is going to float away. And all you're going to be left with is C4B. So this component right here, this is going to be C4B, right? This is going to be C4B. And so what I'll do is I'll go ahead and erase 
this part, and you'll see what I'm doing in a minute. This will be let me do let me fill. So there that was so what we have left is the C4B. And so this component, let me see if I do my best to, to draw it. This component, right? Whatever this was, that one right there is C4A. That's C4A. So the, the mechanism of the C1S is to act as a serine protease, and it hydrolyzes C4 into C4A and C4B. The C4B component is going to stick on the membrane of it's going to stick on the membrane of whatever cell you're trying to destroy. And effectively, the same thing is going to happen to C2, right? So let me do C2 in this bright blue. So C2 is going to interact with C4, but at the same time, another C1S is going to do a serine protease mechanism. So maybe this, maybe, maybe if it's a circle, maybe the C2 looks like that. So that means the, the leaving group right here, this one up here, is C2A, right? So this one right here is C2B. Right, so there's C2B, and 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 so the C2B stays there by interaction with the C4B. Okay, so now ultimately the C2B is is indirectly attached to the antibody. Right, it's it's attached through C4B, which interacts with the C1 component, which is interacting with the antibody. Okay, so now this is an important thing: the C4B and the C2B together have catalytic activity and specifically their catalytic activity is termed C3 convertase and the reason it's called C3 convertase is it's able to split C3 into two components much like C1S was able to. It effectively is going to convert C3 into C3A and C3B. So if I do it like this, let's just make it simple. So there's half of the sphere, right? The other half floats away. So this one up here, this is, of course, C3A. And what's left behind is C3B. And actually, C3B is going to do a similar thing in terms of linkage to the target cell, right? So it's going to, there was an internal thioester bond on C3B. And the, the amine comes out of the target cell and does a nucleophilic acyl substitution and attaches via an amide linkage. Well, one thing that's also in, worth mentioning, at least, is that one of the ways that your body, uh, one of the ways that your body um, prevents at least a large component of complement activating by itself is the fact that the thioester bond is so unstable. So here's C4, and let's go ahead and draw this again. So here I have my internal thioester, right? But it turns out that one of the ways that the body has adapted in order to prevent a whole bunch of complement activating is water can actually inactivate. Water can actually inactivate a large portion of the C4s. So water can do a very similar thing. It can do a nucleophilic acyl substitution, right? And so what you end up with is, and I'll do this again, I'll draw my C4. What you end up with is you end up with the cysteine residue sticking out, right? Just like normal. Of course, that abstracted a proton, but you have a carboxyl group right here. And so this C4 is rendered inactive. It's rendered inactive. So it turns out that about 90% of the C4 proteins actually hydrolyze before they can even bond to a target cell. And what ends up, what, what's, what's important to understand is that the target, really, there are mechanisms to keep your own cells from binding these proteins, but there are cases in which these proteins can bind to our own cells, and you don't want that to happen because ultimately what would happen is those um, proteins would end up destroying our own cells. So one of the protective mechanisms is the inherent instability of the thioester bond. About 90% of the of the thioester bonds hydrolyze, and so then what happens is the amine can't do a nucleophilic acyl substitution, and therefore C4 can't bind. Okay, so this, like we mentioned, the C4B and the C2B together have C3 convertase catalytic activity. And one thing that's also worth, worth mentioning is the C2B, in that case, is the active serine protease. So again, the active serine protease in C3 convertase is the C2B uh, protein. Okay, now another thing that's also worth mentioning is now we have, an, we have a combined C3B. And the C3B, along with the C3 convertase, gets another catalytic activity, and it's C5, C5 convertase. 
And one other thing that's also important to know is that the C5 convertase also retains its, its C3 convertase activity. So this still has its C3 convertase activity, but along with, along with the C3B, now you have, you have C5 convertase activity. So let me extend the antigen a little bit more. Extend the antigen. And let's do another one. Let's do this one in orange. So it, then comes C5. And again, the story is very much the same. So C5 convertase is going to split C5 into two, two, two different proteins. The first one is C5A, right? C5A floats away. And the C5B, uh, and actually, let me actually draw it like this. Actually, the C5B, when, oops, the C5B is actually going to interact with the membrane. So let me actually draw it that way. The C5B is actually going to interact with the membrane of the target cell. So that means this one floats away. So C5, C5A floats away, and this is C5B. And actually, the C5B's interaction with the, 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 the pathogen's membrane is actually what initiates the final common pathway. And the way that you can, you can think about these proteins is that A stands for away. So whenever these, these serine proteases cleave off the A protein, the A floats away. So A is for away, and B is for bound. Now, one thing I'll also mention, because it actually does crop up, is some textbooks, especially the American textbooks, will call the C2B component the C2A. So sometimes you'll see it written uh, C4B, C2A. And, and, and to be honest, that's a stupid way of writing it. Really, the, the, the correct way is to name it as C2B in terms of the bound one. Um, to the pathogen. Okay, so all the ones that remain bound are B components, and the ones that float away are A components. And as we'll find, especially C3A and C5A, they have lives of their own outside of um, at least the the bound protein physiology. So they have lives of their own. And specifically, one thing they do that's worth mentioning is their anaphylatoxins. And what anaphylatoxins do is they essentially promote inflammation. And we'll look at the mechanism of that a little bit later. But suffice it to say for now, this is the, the, the antibody-mediated complement system or the classical pathway. So let's review. So we initially had an antibody that complexed with an antigen. And like, like we mentioned, the antigen can be a very large, um, it can be a very, well, specifically the antigen are specific amino acid residues, right? These are specific amino acid residues, but the antigen itself can be on a very large bacteria, right? It doesn't, it's not necessarily just a simple protein it's binding to, it can be an entire um, bacterial cell, right? And when the antibody binds to the antigen, it changes conformation such that there are exposed binding sites on the FC portion that bind C1Q. And on the C1Q, on the C1Q, once, once it changes conformation, it activates one of the C1Rs. And then the C1R activates its partner C1R, and then the C1Rs activate the, the C1Ss. Then the C1Ss, which have serine protease activity like the C1Rs, they activate C4, and then C1S also activates C2. So C1S is activating both C4 and C2, and then the active complex of C4B, C2B is the C3 convertase. And then this enzyme, C2B being the active serine protease, activates C3 to C3B, and then along with C3B, that's C5 convertase, and then that activates C5. And of course, the C5A floats away, and C5B remains interacted with the pathogen's membrane. Okay, and actually what we'll find is that the C5B is going to initiate the formation of something called a membrane attack complex. So they often abbreviate MAC, and that's just for membrane attack complex, and that's ultimately going to be what lyses the pathogen. So I hope this video made a little bit of sense. In the next few videos, we'll look at, actually in probably the next video, we'll look at the actual formation of the membrane attack complex, and then we'll actually from there go into the other complement systems. See you soon.